Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's emergency management webinar series here at Esri, where we're talking about conducting damage assessments today. So I'm glad you're with us. Thanks for joining. My name is Ryan Lankloss. I'm the Director of Public Safety Solutions here at Esri, and I've got a, a great product manager here at Esri. I think many of you have, have heard his name who have worked in JS for a lot of years. So Ishmael is with us today as the senior product manager over a number of our mobile applications and specifically what we're going to talk about today, which is Survey123. So I'm glad to have Ishmael along with us to not only give you some tips and tricks, but just some of his best practices in working in a mobile environment with Survey123. So thanks, Ishmael, for joining. Our agenda for today is to cover a, a few things. So we're going to start and reframe the conversation of damage assessment in the context of our full webinar series. We're going to take a look at the emergency management operations solution and how damage assessment plays a role in that as one of the key capabilities for emergency management uh, operations. Then we'll take a look at what's available today for both the initial or rapid damage assessment, as well as preliminary damage assessment forms inside of Survey123 and how you can find them. And then certainly, as I mentioned, Ishmael will then start to take us down a pathway of looking at best practices and working with Survey123, and certainly some of the lessons that we've learned over the years in deploying uh, this technology for damage assessment in both connected and disconnected environments. So you'll get a, a great uh, list of activities today. For any Q&A at the very end, we'll certainly kind of toss those out and make sure that uh, your questions get answered today uh, broadly on the, on the side. We'll also follow up with a list of resources after today. So just know that we are recording this webinar as always. You'll get a, an email following up after today, not only with the resources for Survey123 and damage assessment, but also uh, other resources that we think will be valuable for you in emergency management. We'll certainly post this online afterwards. You can come back and reference it or share this with others inside of your agency. So as you go through today, just know of the recording, everybody is muted. If you have any questions, please just use the chat function inside of the GoToWebinar to ask us questions of the panelists, and we'll try to field as many of those as we can today throughout the webinar. And if we don't get to your question today, we'll certainly follow up this afternoon or tomorrow with the follow-up uh, answer for you at that point. So with that, let me just kind of, as I said, start with some context of where we are in the conversation for our webinar series. You know, two ago, we actually started talking about this idea of how emergency managed operations has such a complex challenge. And there are six key workflows that we think build a baseline capability for emergency management officials to truly leverage the power of GIS and location intelligence to respond to all hazards and all incidents. Those six things really break down into these bullet points on the screen, ability to understand a potential impact for a forecast or from an incident that's occurring, certainly understanding where to deploy resources in relation to that impact potential. How do you monitor in real time changing conditions? We spent our last webinar about real time content and looking at weather data and hazard data available to you in the Living Atlas and how you can wire that into web maps and certainly then dashboards that provide real time situational awareness. So, that was the last webinar. If you have interest in learning more about that and couldn't join us, that recording is available online as well. And then the third bullet underneath that Oscar, is the assess and report damage. And that's where we're gonna spend the majority of our time today is really breaking down that key capability to assess and report damage. Now, those six things are really where we're framing our conversation. We'll talk more about managing public information in the future. Know that situation awareness webinar is there with a ton of resources and and available details for you. We're going to dig into damage assessment. If you have questions about any of these three kind of main pillars that we feel really are the foundation for emergency management operations, you know, feel free to chat today or, or reach out to us at the end. You'll get a survey for us just if you'd like to talk and say, have I've thought about something related to one of those key workflows or areas and want to have a conversation, let us know. We'll certainly reach out to you and follow the conversation. So damage assessment, why, why is that so important? I think for many of you that maybe work in a GIS arm of your agency or in your city, community, county, you may get pulled in to support damage assessment for uh, post event. And you know, it's really important to do this well. I think that it is not just about building the historic record, right? Documenting the, the impact post an event, whether that's a flood, an earthquake, a fire, but it's also the ability to generate reports so that Ultimately, we can monitor thresholds for disaster declarations, right? This really is the foundation workflow that allows us to not only create the record, store it, but actually then look at where we are in relation to the thresholds. And that really can expedite the recovery funds back into a community that really helps that community get back up on their feet in this new normal that they may be experiencing. So in the solution set that we've talked about the last couple of webinars, we actually have a solution dedicated 
to the initial or the rapid damage assessment. So that's what you see on the screen. It is a combination of survey one, two, three on the right hand side with a quick form that really works you through the initial damage assessment that's connected through ArcGIS Online to a feature service in our GIS world, back to a dashboard that allows you to not only see the points on the map in relation to where data is being collected, structure by structure for both residential, commercial, or public facilities, but also then to roll up the damage estimates, so that threshold again we're looking at for reporting, uh, for uninsured loss as an example, but also the categorization of major, minor, destroyed, and the like. So this solution exists today. We'll talk a, a little bit about that, and Ishmael will walk us through what that looks like, and certainly you'll see how to, to access that from a solution aspect. And there are tons of great case studies out there. I think many of you have sent us your stories about how you're using ArcGIS to respond uh, and ultimately get into recovery for these, these disasters. You know, just to pull uh, a few of these forward that I think are really interesting for you guys, looking at a state level example for those of you that are joining us from a state agency, you know, the state of California, CAL FIRE is a great example of a team that has deployed capabilities to do damage assessment quickly across all aspects of, of California. So this is, you know, a detail from the campfire in Butte County, unfortunate amount of damage, uh, just a devastating event. But you see the individuals in the field on mobile devices creating that historic record, documenting the damage in photographic evidence, which you see at the top, and then ultimately being able to not only use that internally to drive that declaration and understanding, but certainly then about recovery and resources and allowing citizens that may be impacted, you know, and evacuated from an area to see what that impact is to their community here directly in a web environment. But another great example, and I love this, uh, we can send an article to you if you're interested, we'll include it in the links is New Bern, North Carolina. So for those of you working at a city level, you know, looking at hurricane flooding there in North Carolina that came in, the ability to use this template to then collect that damage assessment at a residential level uh, looking at structures that may be impacted from a flood, and again, creating that historic photographic evidence and the fact that they were able to use this template as a starting point that we're going to talk about today, quickly and rapidly conduct that damage assessment and move forward uh, as powerful. And then for those working at the county level, like another great story from our friends in Douglas County, Nebraska, with the, the riverine flooding that occurred the, earlier this spring is a great example of using this template as well. So Mike Shanlaw tweeted out this great photo and sent us a picture saying, hey, we were able to download and use that template at the county to start doing our structural assessment. But also you'll notice a number of other things they're reporting across the bottom in terms of debris, uh, protective measures and the like. So I think one of the empowering things about this, this pattern of mobile for damage assessment is that you then have the ability to repurpose that same application of Survey123 with additional forms to kind of complete the record that you need to have your field teams collect from different aspects of the incident, whether that's public works related, law enforcement and security related, all the way through the engineering damage assessment component. So I thought this was a great example um, from Douglas County, Nebraska as well. So with that, just a bit of framing, that's what we're gonna talk. How do you do that process, right? How do you launch and start with a template? How do you use Survey123 to its fullest capabilities to help not only just collect the data and create that record, but to start reporting against that. And there are certain best practices for working offline environments. So when you are deploying teams out into the field and you lose cell connectivity, Survey123 supports that. So we're gonna talk a bit about that as, as well as Ishmael kind of gives us some of those best practices today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ishmael to you guys as our Senior Product Manager here at Esri over Survey123. Uh, I'll turn it over to him at this point. He's gonna kind of walk us through that, but certainly again, just ask questions as we go through this. We want to get to as many of those as we can, so we'll be fielding those in real time uh, through the chat function. Just remember, go to webinar, use the chat, and send questions over. And then we'll kind of wrap up with a general Q&A and look at the road ahead as well today. So with that, Ishmael, I'll turn it over to you, and the floor is yours. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Ryan, for uh, the opportunity to come here and and, and share with you some of the uh, things you can do with uh, Survey123. Um, I'm going to talk about best practices for deploying the, the damage assessment uh, solution. Uh, I want to be upfront, I'm not really an expert on damage assessments and the whole process. I'm really an expert on Survey123. So I think you know some of the best practices that I'm going to share with you really apply to many different workflows, but excuse if my jargon is not the most uh, appropriate uh, throughout the presentation. To deploy the solution, the damage assessment solution for structures um, from ArcGIS, uh, you can come to our website and, and, and find basically the solution 
which actually is made out of different components. So as you can see here, um, the I'm going to actually open the, the website, and this is the actual website where you will go and download. Uh, this solution is deployed against ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. And through the use of ArcGIS Pro and a deployment tool, um, we create a number of different uh, things like well, web maps, dashboards, and the survey instruments that will let you capture information in the field. So through this website, uh, you can see a description of the different things that you are going to get. And I will touch in, uh, on all of this in more detail later. And you can actually, right from here, you can open different tabs in your browser to have a quick look at the different deliverables. The main components really of the solution are a dashboard and the survey instruments. Uh, this is a look of the dashboard. Uh, this is of course something you want to configure. So this just provides the foundation for you to get started, but you will want to add your own uh, map and have your own uh, damage assessment layers in it. The dashboard is quite simple. It has at the bottom uh, bunch of different indicators. So you can have a look at the different um, assessments that have been made and the status of each of the, the assessments. And then it actually adds up uh, the damage estimate for uh, all the assessments that have been performed. You can navigate through the different damage assessments by simply clicking on them and accessing some additional information. So again, you know, this is a dashboard that comes ready to go. Uh, you just need to a tailor to your own needs, centering them up at your incident location and hooking this up into your own damage assessment layers. The uh, survey uh, that you are going to get, you're actually going to get three different surveys. Uh, one is for damage assessment or quick damage assessments of uh, commercial buildings, residential buildings, public facilities. Here we are looking at the residential buildings. And what this survey provides is really a basic structure in your ArcGIS instance where you can perform or store information that is important for these damage assessments. It's like a geodatabase model. Uh, the thing here um, when you get this basic uh, survey is that you, you are unlikely going to use this as is. You are going to tailor for your own uh, needs. And that's really what we are going to talk about in this presentation. I, just uh, at a high level, you can see that we have different uh, sections within this quick residential building assessment, uh, information relative to the incident itself, the number, the name, uh, dates and location, etc. Uh, you have another section with the inspection information, who is actually doing the damage assessment. And finally, you have also a section relative to the owner of the, the house and the actual uh, insurance information and finally the damage, the actual damage assessment of the house. This shows a, a more technical view of the different things that you get with the solution when you deploy it into your own RGIS instance. In gray at the bottom, you see the actual data. So we are going to create a damage assessment layer. This is basically the geodatabase schema where you persist all the information. And this layer is going to be shared with the different uh, surveys. Survey for commercial, residential, and public facility damage assessments. On top of this layer, uh, we also create a view for you. And this is actually a good practice to do. Uh, this uh, layer is shared as write, read and write with the survey instruments, but the view actually has only read only access. This allows you to share your data in a secure manner. So people accessing your data for visualization purposes cannot actually edit the information. And on top of this view, uh, there are three maps that are built automatically for you and the dashboard that I demonstrated just a few minutes ago. From a best practices perspective, uh, there are best practices for tailoring your own dashboard to communicate in real time what's going on in the field, uh, for tailoring your maps to preserve the best or more adequate symbology. In this session, I'm going to focus on the surveys. How do we get the damage assessment surveys from ESRI and we tailor them for, the, um, for our own um, 
incidents. And this is important because it's really all about accelerating data capture in the field. I'm going to give you a practical demonstration of a modified form, um, kind of touching on a few important aspects, such as how do I onboard people so they can get the damage assessment tool um, quickly? How do we modify the templates that come from ESRI so we can make them beautiful survey instruments for people to capture data most effectively for your particular incident. And I will also briefly talk about how you can automate workflows. Um, so when damage assessments are submitted, you can notify people via SMS, via email, or even create uh, survey reports of the different damage assessments in a format that complies with the requirements of your organization. So I will do this uh, first. Uh, just to show you what can be done, then I'm going to talk about how it is done. So I'm going to switch here to my uh, phone uh, so you can see um, that I have Survey123 installed here. And typically when you have a group of people doing damage assessments, you may have the luxury of having a training session uh, where you are going to describe them how to download the application, the survey, and how to effectively do the damage assessment. That's the ideal situation. Uh, sometimes though, um, you may not have uh, a chance to do other than maybe send an email uh, to people in advance. So in this email, you can see that I put together a brief email saying, welcome to this you know, team uh, incident and read the damage assessment manual. This will be a link to your manual for the damage assessments. And then you instruct them to install the Survey123 app, which is available in different platforms. And then I added a link here so people can bring their uh, survey easily into their device. So assuming that Survey123 is installed in the device, if you simply click on that particular item, the Survey123 application is going to start and it's going to download right away the survey. So this is actually the survey that we are going to, to explore. And from here, I'm really ready to go. Um, another alternative to download your surveys is to have people open the application and come into the download page uh, after logging in so they can actually look for their survey and download it. But as you can see, the link facilitates bringing the right survey into the device um, uh, more, more quickly. So let's just start collecting data. I'm going to just go through this survey, which as I said before, is really a modification of the template that you get from Esri. So the first thing that I did was to split the survey that comes from Esri into different pages to facilitate navigation throughout the entire form. So we have a, a first page for the incident, for the structure, for the assessment, the owner information. We will go through all of this in a second. In the first page for the incident, you can see that I am automatically calculating certain fields. We know what's the incident number, we know what's the incident name, why in the world people would need to, to actually type this in. So these are set as defaults in the survey, so you don't have to actually type them in. I also, uh, is is also a good idea to provide at the beginning of the survey some notes for people who come late into the game. Uh, this is a link to the actual, uh, the manual. This is a link to the other forms for commercial and public facility buildings. And just in case, a link to call the field coordinator for any questions. So in this case, if I tap on this link, it's going to launch uh, the website with the information about the, the template. But of course, you can include here a link to a PDF. If you click on the link at the bottom, this is actually going to call the field coordinator for people who have any, any questions. Also here, uh, for clarity, uh, I added a small label indicating who is logged in. And as you will see, this is going to be important when we get to the inspector uh, page in here. We are going to move on to the structure uh, page. This is where we collect information about the structure that we are evaluating. Uh, here we have a drop down for the different types of structure. And very often you will know in advance what these types are. This is in fact the list that comes in the template directly. Uh, it's not a bad idea to include an other option so people can uh, type here uh, free text for other structures that not, might not be accounted for in your original 
list. Now, in this case, I'm going to go with, say, a detached home, and you can see that the map is automatically centered at my location. And this is actually the Esri building from which you know, I'm doing the, the presentation. And what is interesting here is that uh, Survey123 is a location-aware smart form application. So you can see at the bottom that the full address is already completed for me, the postal code, even the parcel identification number. So how is this done? Well, uh, we have configured this survey to auto-calculate certain fields based on your own location. So if I were to actually now bring up the map and say, well, this is the location of the house, this is going to change the full address, the postal code, and the parcel identification number. This full address is using a geocoder. So if you actually go into the street, now it's going to give me a range between 900 and 1098, right? It's not an exact address, it's actually a range. Uh, similarly, you can see that the parcel identification number is now missing because I am in the middle of the street. So while this is uh, the full address is obtained through a reverse geocode, the parcel identification number is coming from a point in Polygon query, which I configured with my own layer. So let's go back to the map so you can see that in more detail. I'm going to switch on the base maps and I'm going to select my own web map here. So if I zoom in, you will see that we actually have these blue polygons. These are actually the parcels that I'm querying to determine what is the actual parcel identification number. So in this case, it's um, a parcel number that ends on 105. So if I check that, you can see that the parcel identification number comes automatically into the into the device. So these are actually important things to help people go quickly, more quickly through the form, so they don't have to complete aspects of the form that you know are can be derived from your location. But if you actually want to make modifications, you can always come here and type in modifications to the address, the postal code, etc., as appropriate. These are rules again that uh, is often uh, important to set up to streamline data capture. The USNG coordinate is also automatically calculated based, based on your location. Just for context, while in this page we were using default values, in this page we have been using extensively calculations, dynamic calculations of values, in this case based on location. Let's move on to the next um, page. Uh, this is the assessment page. The date and time are automatically calculated or with a function that retrieves the current time when the form is open. But again, you know, you might want to actually change these values as needed. The extent of the damage is a simple category. I'm going to go with minor. And then the primary cause of damage, I'm going to say it's in this case, it's a flood event. So in the description of damage, you can actually uh, type in or you can even talk to the device. There is minor damage in the garden, and the garage is severely affected. So you can see that we can leverage the speech to text capabilities of your operating system to type uh, free text. And then uh, comes the, the photo. So for the photo, we are just one tap away, and this is going to launch the camera. And here, I'm going to just get my house and I'm going to snap a photo of that house. And this is going to be part of my document, my damage assessment document. It's a photo that gets attached to every information I sent. Now, what I did here is if I tap on the preview, you will see that I added photo watermarking capabilities. So at the top, I'm adding the USNG location where, the, where this photo was taken. And at the bottom, I'm indicating at the time at which the photo was taken. So this information is part of the EXIF of the file, of the JPEG file, but just in case, I'm also burning the information in the image. So even if you were to take this photo out of context through an email or whatever, that data goes along with, with the photo. Through the use of calculations, you can actually bring any information in your uh, device, in your survey, can be brought as a photo watermark. 
Uh, the next aspect here is um, annotation. So this is also something that you can configure on your surveys if you wish to. In this case, I'm going to take a photo. And in this photo, I'm going to add uh, certain annotations. So I'm going to draw an, an arrow here and say that you know this is uh, flooded. And then uh, you may want to actually draw in blue here a small a sketch indicating where is the damage in that particular structure that um, you photographed. Similarly, you can do a sketches on maps and have them uh, associated with your uh, damage assessment. So as you can see, you can take one or multiple photos within survey one, two, three. You can annotate them and send them along with your damage assessment. Uh, let's move on here and do an estimate of the uh, loss, uh, the dollar amount lost on the structure, on the context, on the contents of the structure, impact to jurisdiction, say none, additional comments, say none. And now we are going to move on to the next page. The next page is actually quite boring. It's a simple, um, simple um, page where you can type the phone uh, contact information for that person. Now, you will notice that uh, the information here uh, is in red until the phone is correct. So this is actually, again, you know, built in logic within the form that it's important to add to make sure that people enter the right information. It's always best to do data validation rules while people are in the field than back in the office when it's too too late. So I basically created rules here to make sure that the phones are, are correct. The same goes with the email. Uh, if you don't type a, uh, what looks like an email here, it will actually uh, complain. And then at the bottom, we have other information such as the number of occupants in the house, let's say three, primary residence habitable. So in survey one, two, three, you can configure the look and feel of these inputs to make sure that they facilitate data capture uh, quickly. And that's kind of the trick of the whole thing. How do we create the best possible experience for data capture in the field? The insurance information page, pretty easy, just a checklist and a couple of values here for the insurance deductible and the value uh, before the damage. We're going to get to the end of the, the form. Uh, this is the inspector page. So the inspector page is actually automatically populated. Since I know who is logged in in the device, I can look up the inspector ID, the name, the email, the phone number, even the affiliation. So there is no need for people to type this in. If you already have this information, you can automatically look that up uh, with logic in your form and auto-calculate these values based on the person that is currently logged in. So with this, I'm going to actually go and send the information to uh, ArcGIS. In this case, I am connected, although if you actually disconnect from the network, this survey is going to work right away. You don't have to do anything as a user. Uh, this survey is set up to work offline. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to switch to a web browser where we are going to look at the actual information that we have been capturing. So this is the Survey123 website. Um, of course, the data that we have captured is going to pop automatically into our dashboard, but I want to go and have a look at the actual uh, data from uh, this website uh, to demonstrate a few other things that uh, you might not be uh, aware of. So this, it's a basic map view of the different assessments that uh, we have been submitting. Actually, the one we submitted um, is going to be at the very top. So if we go to the table here, that's the actual um, assessment that we submitted uh, last. You can see here the incident number, information about the inspector at the very beginning of the table. And if I scroll to the side, you're going to see the full address, the USNG coordinate, date and time when this was taken, um, the extent of the damage, the cause of the damage, and information about the occupant, and in short, all the information that we actually captured throughout the, um, the demonstration with the survey. We can present this information in a form factor instead of as a table. So you can see here, 
all the data we have captured, including the location, full address, is basically the same data, but presented as a form. And here, by the way, here are the, the photos. Uh, with the photos, as I indicated before, we're going to have information in the EXIF of the photo. So this photo was taken, you know, this is the time when the photo was taken, uh, the device that was used to take the photo, the direction in which I was looking when the photo was taken, and also the exact location where the photo was taken. So all of this information is actually part automatically of your data within ArcGIS, and you can exploit it for your own purposes. Now, very often, uh, these type of um, forms, this doesn't have the format that I really want to use to present the data. So I want to present all the damage assessments following a very specific uh, format for my report. So this is actually um, possible um, in Survey123. Basically, you can define the look and feel of your um, reports using Microsoft Word and then upload the template into ArcGIS so we can mix your data with your template and create um, high quality printable documents for all the damage assessments you created. So in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, basically a filter and I'm going to say okay get every damage assessment where the extent of the damage assessment is um, minor and then zoom to that location and once I have this uh, select selection of records, I have eight records selected, I'm going to go into the feature report and say, take these eight records, use the basic template, and then generate a report. So this is basically, again, going, it's going to get my Word template with my, my own layout, my own look and feel for the report and it's going to mix it up with my own data. So I have some documents that I can email uh, to people. So let's wait. This will take just a, a few a few seconds. Okay, there you go. So now we're going to save the file. This data has been actually uploaded into my ArcGIS account and I can also quickly access this from uh, my browser. So I'm going to send this into a Let's see, I'm going to open this with Windows Explorer. And these are the eight documents, one for every damage assessment uh, we did. The last one is number 12, is here at the bottom. So I'm going to just open that guy so you can see what these uh, reports look like. So again, just like you can configure the survey to your own needs, you can configure these um, reports with your own logo, your own header, with you know your own arrangement of the tables, etc. Here I decided to add a section for the incident information. The blue one is for the structure, which includes a map. Um, and basically, all the data we captured is uh, compiled in this report. This is information about the owner, the inspector, and in this page I have the information about the assessment. So as you can see, it's minor minor damage. There is minor damage in the garden, in the garage is severely affected. So this is basically all the data that we captured and the photo with the watermarks. On top of this, um, very often in these fluent um, workflows where things happen very quickly, you want to automate things. Uh, you saw how I was able to create the reports. I could also have chosen to export the data into an Excel file to share it with people. But very often you want to automate this sharing of information as much as possible. So if I uh, go into my into my uh, email client, let's open Outlook here, you'll see that under the covers, while we were uh, working on the website, looking at the data and such, things happened. So I just got a new email just five minutes ago, and this email is telling me that a new damage assessment was submitted by this user. The extent of the damage was minor. This was the address, the structure type, and here I have a link. And this link actually takes me to the report. So in other words, automatically, as I was sending the survey, a process was essentially creating this template, this Word document, and then attaching that document into an email so a person could get it right away. So this is 
basic functionality included with survey one, two, three, which can be configured for your own purposes. So you need to think, well, who is going to receive these emails? What's the format of these emails, etc. Similarly, you can also automate um, SMS notifications if you if you like. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of how some of these things were done. But in this case, I'm not going to do it with the solution damage assessment from ESRI. I'm actually going to use some uh, preliminary damage assessment templates that FEMA has shared for Survey123 users. So I'm going to touch on similar concepts, but it's just going to be a different, a different uh, survey. So in this case, I'm going to start um, with uh, Survey123 Connect. This is basically the tool that uh, you use to create your own surveys. Just like we created a survey for the rapid damage assessment, I can come here and say, I want to create a new survey. I'm going to say here, um, you know, flood redlands. And I'm going to go into community. And here I'm going to search for FEMA. And this is going to list all the FEMA templates. Um, this template is not coming from ESRI. This is actually coming from FEMA. Uh, we have the FEMA individual assistance and the public assistance forms for preliminary damage assessments. So I'm going to say I'm going to select uh, the, the FEMA one for the IA, and then I say create survey. This is downloading from FEMA the specification for their PDA form into my computer so I can create my own flavor of it. So obviously the beauty here is the standardization. Uh, FEMA expects this information to be captured. Um, they don't actually want to control how you capture the information, but they want to make sure you capture the correct information. And this is basically what this survey gives you, it gives you exactly the structure, the fields that FEMA wants you to uh, capture. So this is all expressed in um, an Excel file. Uh, just for clarity, this file is not where the data gets persisted. All the data gets persisted in ArcGIS. That's how, why you can use it from Pro, Dashboard, and other tools. But this is really the place where you define what this form is going to look like. So this is, again, where you come and tailor this to make it most effective for your own uh, purposes. So for example, in this case, say incident information. Well, again, you know, here the template comes out of the box with a drop-down list with all the, the states. But this wouldn't really be needed if you know that the incident is, say, in California. So you can come here and say, look for the uh, state territory and say, well, I'm going to go into my Excel. This is the label of uh, the, the question. But now I'm going to go into the default column, default, and I'm going to say, go with CA. The list of states is actually part of the Excel file that FEMA provides is right here. And these are the labels that will be presented in the lists. And these are the values that get persisted in the database. It's basically a geodatabase domain. So if I say the default is CA, when I save my Excel definition, uh, Connect is going to refresh the FEMA form, which is now my own form for my own incident. And you will see that the state automatically is going to be California. Now, similarly, if I know people are not going to change that, I may actually choose to say this is a hidden question. So we are going to capture this value, but we are not going to present it uh, to the user. Uh, similarly, here we have a very long list of different event types that could have caused the damage. But in your case, you may want to trim down the list to remove unnecessary choices so users don't get distracted and they can do their job uh, most effectively. So very quickly, in the interest of time, I'm going to just get rid of a bunch of them, uh, delete. And then as soon as I save, you will see that the state question will go away, but the data will still be sent as FEMA wants. And then the list of values will be trimmed 
to make it easier for people to select what is most appropriate. So you can see here, you know, how you can tailor again the survey for most effective data capture. In the demonstration before, I showed how we can auto calculate things like the city, the county, the address. So let's actually do that. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, GeoNet and I'm going to have a look at this blog post that was uh, published some time ago, which describes how to do reverse geocoding in Survey123. So this blog post describes basically the technique. Uh, you can use this expression to do a reverse geocode based on the current location. And this expression in your form is going to return a JSON, which includes all the information you need. So um, I'm going to go and grab the expression. And very quickly, I'm going to set this up to capture, say, the city. So I'm going to scroll down. And then I'm going to look for the city question, which is right here. That's the city question is text. And I'm going to navigate back to the calculation column. And this is the column that controls what values are entered, right, um, when uh, the form opens. So in this case, since I want the city, I'm going to change that to city. And I think that uh, will do. So let's update the form and see what happens. Just as a reminder, in Survey123, we use basically the location of your device to do all of these uh, calculations. So the map is right here. I'm running on a Windows machine, which is a little bit slow providing the, the location. But basically, once I have it, there you go. The city town has been automatically calculated. Following a similar pattern, I could do the county, the zip code, the address, um, etc. Once you are happy with uh, all of these changes, uh, what you will want to do is to basically uh, publish them onto um, onto the web. So that's actually something that um, you can do uh, pretty pretty easily. Let's. So let's publish this guy uh, so we can actually have a taste of what this form looks like in a device or in a web browser. And that's actually an interesting aspect of these uh, templates. You can choose to deploy these into mobile devices to support offline workflows, but you can also choose to publish these surveys onto the, onto the web. So. Um, on the web, you may want to publish your surveys if you want actually citizens to uh, report uh, their own damage assessment, for example, or if you plan to have people sitting in a desk, kind of having people come in and they are doing interviews. So um, I got an error uh, on publishing because FEMA has inserted here um, basically placeholders for you to indicate the feature layer on your own server where the data is going to go. In my case, I'm going to remove those uh, because I will let a Survey123 create these layers in my own server automatically. So you can choose to build this survey on top of an existing feature service, or you can let Connect actually create the feature service based on all the questions you added into the form. This will take a minute, and it's essentially creating, again, feature layers and form items within my organization. Now I can come here and say open this in a web application. So it's going to open a web browser and I will likely have to log in. Uh, it seems like I'm already logged in in this browser. This is the actual form that we 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 created and we changed. That's my location. So I won't, I won't do more here, but you can see how you can really tweak these forms to your own uh, purposes um, to, to do the most effective uh, data capture. In many occasions, you may actually want to build multiple forms on top of the same feature layer 
so I could choose to deploy this on the web and have a link in a website so people uh, with or without an account can submit data. I may also choose to bring this into a mobile device. So this is the actual survey that we just published uh, right from here. If I go to collaborate, you can see that you can share your survey with different groups within your organization or even everyone. And then very quickly create a link which you can include again in an email like you saw before, or you can even uh, create a barcode um, for people to quickly, oops, to quickly load the form. So back into my phone, I'm going to open the camera and then I'm going to scan the barcode and this will again open survey one, two, three and uh, load, in this case, the FEMA survey that I had created. Typically, when using the barcodes, I like to use things like this. Let me open the camera here. So this is like a, an incident battle card, ops. Uh, this is for a different event, but you can you know, paste this on the wall and then have people come in and quickly open their form in their mobile device or in a, in a web browser to start capturing data. So your dashboard comes to life. Very often, you know, people ask is like, well, you know, you told me that this uh, survey works offline and it actually does. I'm not going to disconnect because you won't see my phone, but you can capture data while offline. All the data gets stored locally and then you can submit it, but the map doesn't. The map will not work offline unless you set up your survey accordingly. So back into GeoNet, uh, you can look for um, offline tile package creator. So again, we have another blog and this actually describes the whole process. I'm bringing this up because one of the points I want to make is that a lot of the things I'm describing here, I don't intend you to completely get just by looking at the demos. I just want to show you the possibilities. The instructions, the step-by-step -step instructions are often in GeoNet or the documentation. So anyways, this actually describes how you can configure your maps to go offline, but essentially is as simple as going into the folder of your uh, survey, and clicking here, and then copying a tile package in that folder. So the next time you publish, when people download the survey, it comes along with the TPK right away. You don't have to do anything else. So let's come back to the slides here. Um, we touched a little bit on the basics of building or modifying these surveys. I was using an Excel file, um, the syntax to define the look and feel, the contents and the data validation rules within your form is actually called XLS forms. So that's how you can set the defaults like we did for California. This is how you hide questions like we did for the state, how you can add calculations like the calculation we added for reverse geocode, how you can publish to the web, um, etc. The, the item that I didn't uh, touch uh, because we are running out of time is this business of automating email notifications. But I will show you very briefly how this is, um, how you can actually do this. Um, Survey123 supports this notion of webhooks and webhooks really allow you to automate workflows after your survey is submitted. And that is often done with third-party tools like Microsoft Flow or Integromat. So you are at the moment looking at my web browser. This is not from Esri. This is actually a tool from a third-party company. It's called Integromat. And Microsoft Flow as well has a similar process. These tools allow you to automate processes. In this case, I'm basically watching for a survey one, two, three form. And then I'm creating a feature report. Then I'm downloading the report, uploading to Google Drive, and then I'm sending an SMS and a Gmail with links to these particular documents that we created. So um, there are again blogs that describe how you can do this. In fact, we even have a live training seminar which uh, describes uh, how to automate email notifications and it actually describes how to use Microsoft Flow and Integromat but beyond email notifications, you can do many other things. A classic one is, you know, you have your damage assessments coming and you want to add the data, not only to ArcGIS, but also to a 
Office 365 Excel file. So people throughout the organization can access the data in the format that they prefer. And that's also something you can automate with uh, Survey123. There are many places where you can learn some of the tips that I shared here. Uh, first of all, our GeoNet blog and its discussion forum. We also have YouTube video tutorials. Uh, we have over 20 of them. They are three minute video tutorials um, that describe how to use the XLS form specification, how to edit features, how to go offline. Then we have the documentation, learn lessons, and even training seminars. In this PowerPoint deck that we are going to share with you, you actually have the links. So if you come to the slides and you click on this guy, this is going to open the playlist with all the training videos. So my intent is just to bring to you these, you know, these different resources so you can go through them. Uh, there are a gazillion other resources. These are, you know, some of the very specifics. Uh, like for example, you saw that the survey was calculating the USNG coordinates automatically. How can I make that happen? Well, you click here. This is going to take you to a blog that describes, you know, how to use USNG and MGRS within Survey One Two Three. And the same goes with, you know, all of these, all of these here. Like, how do I add a watermark to a photo? How do I store location metadata and why? Um, how to automate email notifications or how to use the FEMA PDA templates as well. So there is an entire blog that describes, you know, how they can be used, how they can be published to the web, to your mobile device, how you can tweak them, etc. cetera. Um, with that, I'm going to open for questions. I don't want to run out of time. Excellent, thank you, Ishmael. I appreciate the time. So we do have a couple of questions that uh, we'll share back over, I think are, are broadly applicable. So. One of the questions that, that people are asking is connecting a GPS device with Survey 123 for more, you know, high precision or accuracy related to the field data collection. Could you speak to that really briefly? Yes. So um, essentially, uh, the way this works similarly to how collector works. So you can connect to your phone uh, via um, Bluetooth an external GPS receiver, and then within the Survey 123 application, you can actually uh, go into the settings right here and then go into location and manage providers. So once you have a, say a Trimble device or a Bad Elf, a EOS, an Arrow 100 connected via Bluetooth, it will pop here and then you can actually um, uh, leverage that information. What is uh, most interesting in Survey123 is, let me actually show you here, is that once you have that device connected to Survey, not only we can get better locations, we can also use metadata from this external GPS receiver to build on-site data validation rules. So this blog post describes the different types of metadata that you can get out of your external GNSS receiver, and then you can use it to store this information as attributes, as, as usual, but also to perform um, add constraints. So for example, here we are capturing the speed of the, you know, as reported by the GPS, and we are using this to provide a warning to the user. So we are, they actually don't, you know, don't move while fixing the location. Or you can actually say if the horizontal accuracy is less than blah, or if the fixed type is not, um, you know, this type of fixed type, I don't want you to submit or I want you to get, um, a message. Excellent. Thanks, Ishmael. So another good question I thought was appropriate for everybody here is the fact that you went through the process of collecting data on Survey 123, you're in the field, you're submitting the data points back in, but is there a way to go back to the device and recover data? So if I needed to go back and reload data that somebody submitted uh, for any reason, can you maybe speak to that a bit? Yes. So uh, that is actually um, we actually have a video that demonstrates how to enable the the inbox. So I'll show you here uh, a brief video that, uh, or animation, I should say. Uh, this is, let me think, this will be the polygons and lines. So um, here, uh, this block describes how you can work with lines and polygons, right, within Survey. And you can do something like this. 
So basically, the way you work with existing features within Survey is by enabling the inbox. Okay, so this is what this animation is showing. These blue uh, footprints are existing features, and you can open them, change their attributes, and send the data to update. So this is the inbox right here, right? You enable the inbox in Survey123 to basically query features from a feature service. They come up as a list or a map, as you can see, and then you can literally tap on that particular feature in the inbox, change the attributes, and then it will change the um, the feature back end in the database. So you're really not creating new features, you are updating existing features. And the way this is done is through the inbox. And again, you know, if I were to learn about this, I would actually go to the, to the YouTube list, um, or since I would go here, YouTube, so you can do this at home as well. You can go and say survey one, two, three, editing existing data. And there you go. That's the video. It's three minutes and it actually shows the whole process, you know, the concept and then how you come into uh, connect to actually enable that functionality, right? Yeah. This is where it describes it. That's perfect. So I think you hit on actually two other questions. So <laughs> perfect timing in your response. One was the ability to edit more than just points. I think you reflected that in one of the blog posts. I so certainly will share that uh, broadly. And then the other thing was, how do I pick up existing data and then start to work against a uh, you know, point layer that's already been collected as an example and carry it to the next level? And you kind of spoke to that in the last example in your YouTube environment. So we'll just make sure that collectively those on the phone, you'll get links to the full list that uh, Ishmael is showing here as well. I guess the last thing I think would be appropriate, and I think a lot of people are, we've had several questions about this, is Ishmael, your, and your perspective, can you compare and contrast a bit of collector versus survey one, two, three, and when I would want to use one versus the other, just a bit of the higher level, why we're investing our time in the form-based centric aspect of survey one, two, three? Right, that's, that's a great question. It comes very often, so I'm very happy to take it. So our mission in Esri is to create the best possible experience for people to capture data in the field. And there is no magic wand to this. There is not magic solution. There is not one single app that is going to fit all the different workflows. We actually don't have just collector and survey. We have yet another one, which is called quick capture. You might, well, might be wondering, it's like, why do we create so many apps? It's like, again, because there are different workflows that require you know, different user experiences. Collector is really about map-centric data capture. So if you want to start with a map, you want to add lines and polygons and, and, and points to a single map, Collector is the way to go, is the best experience. It's actually designed for that. So you can bring an editable map into your device. Survey123 is, is, is different, is really about smart forms. Like we were going through some of these you know, forms in the demonstration uh, you know, that have so many sections, so many questions, so many rules. And that's all done uh, through survey one, two, three. In this case, the map is actually one of the questions within the form, but just um, one. So for a workflow like a damage assessment, you are likely going to use survey one, two, three, because these uh, damage assessments often have complicated uh, data validation rules and many questions that are best handled with a form-centric approach. Uh, lastly, you have quick capture, which is more for quick at speed observations. And that we can talk about in a different webinar. The trick here is that, you know, there are some times where you are not sure what actually is going to work best. And in these situations, I say, you need to actually understand what is possible with each of the tools and run exercises with your field users. So you understand what is the tool that best addresses their own their own needs. I have seen a lot of people who actually combine the tools. Classic example is I use Explorer for ArcGIS to display tens of thousands of building footprints. And then in these building footprints, I have a pop-up that launches the Survey123 inspection. Why? Because the complexity of the form cannot be modeled in Explorer, but at the same time, about the best way to open the inspection form for an appropriate property is actually to start with the map. So they go and combine Explorer and, um, and Survey. I think that you know, understanding, having hands-on 
experience configuring projects and deploying projects with each of these applications will help you understand what is best in each scenario. What I can almost say for sure is that there is no single tool that is going to work well in every data collection scenario you may have. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. That was really good. I think so. If you have questions, you know, there, as Ishmael alluded to, there are tools that are kind of purpose driven, right, for different aspects. So if you'd like to kind of talk about that a bit more, certainly at the end, reach back out to us, let us know what we can do to kind of help you uh, move forward from there. So just closing out, I know we're at the top of the hour. So I just want to say thanks again to Ishmael for sharing his experience, as I think you certainly got the extendability that exists within Survey 123, but also some best practices and tools to make the damage assessment process much easier. So thanks, Ishmael, for doing that. We covered a ton of questions. Uh, there were a lot that we answered along the way. Certainly, if we didn't get to that, apologies that we weren't able to field all the questions. There were a lot that came in, so we will follow up uh, on that front, but just keep the questions coming even after today. And we will share everything back to you as well uh, moving forward. So next steps, expect from us an email back. You'll have this recording documented. Uh, a lot of the links that uh, Ishmael shared to you in slide form, you'll get those in an email, so you'll be able to reference those back. And certainly if you're looking for where to find the solution, where do I get started, are there other things related to this broader ecosystem for emergency management that we've been talking about in the webinar, you'll find the link directly on the screen. Esri.com slash emergency will take you uh, to that landing page. And ultimately, we love suggestions, ideas, ways to make our products, our workflows, our solutions better. So if you have any ideas about where we should go next, how we can improve, if you'd like to talk about problems, give us feedback. Certainly you've got my contact information. Just R. Langloss at Esri.com. Feel free to reach out at any point. And ultimately with that, we'll see you in the next webinar. We'll pick up again in 2020. Uh, we'll continue our conversations moving forward. But I just want to say thanks for all the support that you've given us as a community over the years and helping us do a better job of delivering capabilities. And with that, a broad thank you to all the team and to Ishmael again for today. And we'll see you on the next webinar coming up. Thanks, everybody.